Hello there, Mr. Sutton here, bringing you the BC Calculus 7.5 Part 2 Homework Solutions on Alternating Series Error Bound. For this problem, a function is evaluated using the series below. If the function value is approximated with the first 56 terms of the series, we want to know the error bound. So the key on this one is recognizing that we have an alternating series with this negative 1 to an exponent, and the terms are decreasing in absolute value to 0. As the n value gets larger, we only are growing in the denominator, so we keep getting smaller and smaller terms. Since we have alternating and decreasing an abs value to zero, that means by the alternating series error bound, the error is just going to be the absolute value of the next term. Well, what is the next term? If we've used the first 56 terms, we need term 57. So plugging 57 in for n, and by the way, when we do this, we can get rid of the, uh, the negative one, since we're gonna do this inside an absolute value, we're going to have 1 over 57 ln of 57 in absolute value. That's what our error is going to be less than. Let's just put this on the calculator now. So plugging that in gives us about 0 .0043. And if we need to be accurate to three decimals, we're going to round up because this is an upper bound on error. So we'll call this uh, less than 0 .005. On this problem, they're saying the Taylor series for ln of x centered at x equals 1 is given by this sigma function here. And we're saying that f is the function given by the sum of the first three non-zero terms of this series. So we want the max value of absolute value of ln of x minus f of x uh, on this interval here. Um, so they're essentially asking us to find the maximum possible error for uh, ln of x versus this polynomial approximation. Let's start by actually writing out this f function. So this is just the first three non-zero terms. Um, so we just plug in 1, 2, and 3 and see what happens here. So if I plug in 1, this becomes a positive, And then I've got x minus 1 to the 1 over 1. That's just x minus 1. If I plug in 2, now this is negative, And I've got x minus 1 squared over 2. And finally, plugging in 3, this is negative again, or actually positive, because it's uh, an even exponent and we have x minus 1 cubed over 3. Now this appears to alternate. And depending on what you're plugging in, this may be also decreasing. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, but before we go ahead and use the alternating series error bound, let's make sure that we're meeting the conditions. So the tricky thing on this is they're giving us a range of x values. Um, so we have to consider all the x values and whether these will all make this thing alternate and de decrease in absolute value to 0. Let's test alternating first. So if I plug in a number bigger than 1, this is a positive, this is a negative, uh, this is a positive. So it's alternating with numbers bigger than 1. How about numbers smaller than 1, like between 0.3 and 1? Let's plug in 0.5. If I do that, this first thing becomes negative. This next thing is going to be negative no matter what because we're squaring all this input stuff. This third thing is going to also be negative. Um, so we see that if we have anything less than 1, specifically between 0.3 and 1, this series is actually not going to alternate, which means we can't even use the alternating series error bound, um, which is kind of a deal breaker, it seems. However, don't despair. The, the key on this one is that we're actually allowed to use the calculator, which means we can actually calculate the true value of our original function ln of x and compare that to whatever this polynomial is giving us to see what gives us the biggest possible error. So to do this a little more systematically, um, I'm just going to create a new function, which I'm going to call e of x, which stands for error for me. That's just going to be ln of x minus f of x. So I'm just officially calling this something without the absolute value. I'm not going to worry about the absolute value just yet. So what I want to do is maximize or minimize this e of x function. I'm actually going to do the candidates test on this thing, and I'm going to pick whatever takes this further away from 0. So to do that, I'm going to need to take the derivative of this to get those critical values. And we'll also have to plug in our endpoints of 0.3 and 1.7. So that's our game plan. e prime of x, let's get that. That's going to be 1 over x for the ln of x there. And now I'm going to be subtracting the derivative of all of this stuff. And I'm actually going to write out what it is and then put it in my calculator. So this first thing, derivative, is just going to be 1. But remember, we're subtracting all this, so this is going to be minus 1. Next, using my power rule, the 2's cancel. We just have x minus 1. 
and we're subtracting minus that, so we're actually adding x minus 1. And then finally, this last term becomes the threes cancel, so this is just x minus 1 squared, and now we're going to be subtracting that. And we need to figure out where this derivative equals 0, which you might be able to do this without a calculator, but let's just plug it in anyway. So here's what I've plugged in my calculator so far. I've got my f of x function in y1, and I used that to create my e of x function, ln of x minus y1 minus f of x. And I need to do the derivative of my e function now in y3. I could actually write all this out, but I'm going to be kind of lazy. Since I've already spelled out what it is on paper, I can take a little shortcut on the calculator. I'm going to do math 8 to get derivative. With respect to x, I'm going to do alpha trace y2, and then I'm going to say x equals x. And this will actually let me graph that. Um, it's going to be a little slower graphing it because my calculator is constantly making derivatives, but I'm just going to roll with it. I don't feel like retyping all that stuff. And I'm going to deselect these other two functions. Now, later on, I'm going to use this e function here in y2 to actually plug in some values and see what gives me the biggest values, but I'm just graphing for now. I also need to know my window. Uh, so for window, I'm going to use 0 0.3 to 1.7 because that's the only values I care about here. So let me plug those in, and then zoom zero, zoom fit, and let's see what we've got. So this might take a little while to graph the derivative, but we'll just patiently wait. So here it goes. It's actually not that slow. We'll take what we can get. So it looks like this is the x value 1 in here. It kind of looks like maybe it's going through one, but it's hard to tell. And that's okay, because I'm just going to do second trace and do the zero function now. Uh, so second trace zero. Let's click a little to the left. Let's go far enough out that we're sure we're not on the x-axis. And then let me go a little bit to the right. Move my spider here. Come on, spider, move faster. Put some pep in that step. All right, there we go. Enter one more time. And survey says, yeah, that's basically 1. Okay. So here's what I had in my graph. X equals 1. And if you plug it in, I mean, 1 is going to cancel out these parentheses. 1 over 1 minus 1 is going to be 0. So it makes sense. All right. So now we have to do our candidates test. We're going to plug in 1 along with my two endpoints of 0.3 and 1.7 to see what that comes out to. Let me start by plugging in 0.3. So back to the calculator we go. Let me get out of my grapher screen, and I'm going to do second, or actually alpha trace, and then y2 is where I stored my e function. So I'm going to do y2 of 0.3. That gets me negative 0.1446. And let me do the rest of these on the calculator, and then I'll display it all here. Uh, so let me go back up here, and let me do now 1 instead of 0 0.3. That comes out to 0, which I guess shouldn't surprise us too much. Um, and then let's do 1.7. And that comes out to another negative, negative 0 0.0387. So here are my results. 0.3 gave us this. 1 gave us 0. And then 1.7 gave, gave us this other negative number. Um, so the absolute max on this is actually zero, which kind of makes sense because this was a local max. We were increasing for the original function until we got here, then we were decreasing. But now uh, between these two, it looks like the local, the absolute min is going to be this first one. And we're looking for the maximum absolute value of this stuff. So we just want the value that takes us furthest away from zero. That's going to be this first value here. And they've rounded off to three decimals. So if we're trying to bound the error, we're going to round up automatically on that third decimal. So we're going to say that error is going to be less than 0.145, which is going to give us answer choice C. For this problem, we have an infinite series S that's being approximated by some polynomial version of the series. And we want the least value of k for which the alternating series error bound, they're spelling it out here, guarantees the absolute difference is less than three hundredths. 
So we're basically asking how many terms do we need to get an error bound of less than 3 over 100. So the first thing to notice here is that they're, they're saying alternating series error bound. But let's just double check to make sure that's actually the case. So in this series, it looks like our terms are definitely alternating. We have the negative 1 to the exponent there. Um, and we are plugging in numbers to the denominator. So the denominator grows while the numerator stays put, meaning this thing is alternating and decreasing an absolute value to 0. That means that the error is going to be less than the absolute value of the next term. This is the alternating series error bound uh, philosophy here. So we need to write an expression for the next term in terms of k, and then we'll just set that equal to 3 over 100 and see what k value actually makes that happen. So if I plug k in, the, the kth term would be 2 over k. So the next term then is going to be 2 over k plus 1. And I don't need to worry about the negative because I'm inside absolute value here. All right, so this 2 over k plus 1 needs to at some point take on a value of 3 over 100. There is some k value that gives us this error threshold. So you can solve this on the calculator, or you could do it algebraically. So uh, if we do it on the calculator, let me see that here. So here's what I've entered in my y equals. I have the left and the right halves of this equation. And for my window, I'm not really sure what to use, um, but our answer choices look like they're hovering somewhere between 64 and 70. Um, so that's probably not a bad set of values to go between. Let me do uh, 60 to, I don't know, 75, whatever. I could do 0 to 100 too. Um, but let's start there. And then let's see if we can figure out where these things cross. All right, so we've got a pretty good window on where we're crossing. Uh, let's do second trace, intersect, enter, enter, enter. And that comes out to about 65.667 and some change. So that was one way to do it. Now, you also could have done this algebraically if you just cross multiplied and solve for k that way. Either way, we get a k value of almost 66. So the question is, do we need a number that's bigger or smaller than this? Well, since the error gets smaller and smaller as the k value gets bigger, um, that means to guarantee we get something less than 3 over 100 for error, we need our k value to be a little bit bigger than this. So 66 is the first whole number that's bigger than the true intersection point there. So we're going with choice B on this one. For this free response, no calculator free response, we're given this f of x function, 1 over 1 plus x cubed, and they even gave us the Maclaurin series for it, which was nice, but we could have generated it ourselves. I mean, we have the, the first term, and then we're just multiplying by negative x cubed each time, because this is really a geometric. Anywho, uh, we want to find the first three non-zero terms in general term for f prime for Maclaurin series. Okay, so we're just going to take this series they gave us and take all the derivatives. So we need the first three non-zero terms. Derivative of 1 is 0, so that doesn't really help. The next derivative, though, that's going to be 3x squared, negative 3x squared. After that, we've got positive 6x to the 5th, minus 9x to the 8th. And now the general term. We're just going to multiply by that exponent of 3n. So I'm going to be alternating still, negative 1 to the n. Uh, but now I'm going to have 3n times x to the 3n minus 1. And there we go for the Maclaurin series. For this problem, we're using our results from part A, which I will rewrite here, to find the sum of this infinite series. Okay, well, if they want us to use those results, that must mean there's a connection between what we did in part A and this new series that they've given us. If you look closely at the pattern here, we've got a negative 3, something squared. We've got a 6, something to the 5th, 9, something to the 8th. It looks like what we've done is taken the f prime series and just plugged one half into that. So that's what we really need to figure out is f prime of one half. If we can figure out f prime of one half, that is going to give us the sum of this infinite series. Well, we don't have a function yet for f prime, but we do have a function for f. And here's the important part. This f prime series that we got was based off of this series, and this series they said 
converges to this f function between the x values negative 1 and 1. Now this is important because if you're plugging in 1 half for x, that's a number that's in this interval of convergence. Basically means uh, if I plug 1 half into this function, I get the same thing that I would get by plugging 1 half into this function. And the same is going to be true of the derivatives. If I plug 1 half into this derivative, I'm going to get the same thing I would get plugging 1 half into the derivative of the f function they've given us up here. So, sounds like it's time to find f prime. So I'm going to rewrite f to make this a little easier. I'm going to write this as 1 plus x cubed to the negative 1. So now that I can use my power rule, let me go ahead and do that. So this is going to be f prime. Now this is going to be negative all this stuff to the negative 2 times a tail of 3x squared. And at this point, it's time to plug in 1 half. This 3x squared, if I rewrite this whole thing as a fraction, 3x squared ends up in the numerator. So that's 3 times 1 half squared upstairs. We have a negative fraction now overall. And this other stuff is coming downstairs. So I've got 1 plus 1 half cubed quantity squared all of that downstairs. At this point, you've got all constants. So if there was ever a candidate for uh, you don't need to simplify in a free response, I would say this is it. But if you're going to take the risk and keep going, what do we have on the top here? We have 3 times 1 fourth. That's 3 fourths. Still have that negative out in front. Downstairs, this is 1 eighth plus 1. That's going to be 9 eighths. Squaring that, though, we have 81 sixty fourths. Still want to keep going? OK. Uh, same change flip. We've got negative 3 fourths times 64 over 81. 4 and 64 gives us a 16 up top. 3 and 81, that's going to give us a 27 downstairs. So negative 16 over 27 is going to be our final answer on this one. On this part, they want us to give the first four non-zero terms in general term for the Maclaurin series of integral x, or 0 to x of f of t dt. So basically uh, integrating this thing. Now if we take the antiderivative of this thing term by term, the first term we're going to get is going to be x and everything else is going to have an x in it. So that when we pl plug in this lower limit of 0, that's just going to zero out that whole second part that we're supposed to subtract. Um, so the long and short of it is, rather than turning all of these into t's inside an evaluation box, I'm just going to go straight to the antiderivative of all this stuff. So we're going to end up with x minus, this will be uh, x to the 4th over 4, or 1 4th x to the 4th, either of those. And then we'll have x to the 7th over 7, minus x to the 10th over 10. And then over here, this is going to be negative 1 to the n over 3n plus 1, times x to the 3n plus 1. And there's your uh, integral for the Maclaurin series. For this last part of the problem, they want us to use the first three non-zero terms of the infinite series from part C, which I will rewrite here at least most of it. I didn't bother putting the general term because we're not going to need it here, but I put the first four terms. So they want the first three non-zero terms, and there's a reason why they only ask for three here, to approximate integral from zero to one half of f of t. And we'll deal with the second part of the problem in a minute, but let's do this first part here. So I just need to take these first three parts of this series and uh, essentially plug one half into it. The way I've written this, I'm already accounting for the fact that zero is the lower limit. So it's just going to come down to whatever I'm plugging in for this x here that's going into these x's. So this is going to be 1 half. And this is approximately 1 half. I'll write approximately equals. Um, so this integral is approximately 1 half minus, well, this is really going to be 1 over 2 to the 4th times 4, plus 1 over 2 to the 7th times 7. And that's it. Now, I could simplify this, but it's a free response, and I don't need this approximation for anything else. So I'm just going to leave this as it is. Moving on now, what are the properties of the terms of this series here um, that guarantee this approximation is within one ten thousandth of the exact value of the integral? Okay, so taking a look at, at this particular series, one thing to notice is that these terms are alternating on the interval from 0 to 1 half. These terms are alternating. And also, if you take a look at the, the terms as we go, um, as we move on and on, the terms get smaller and smaller, at least in terms of absolute value, because your denominator just keeps getting bigger and bigger. 
So these terms we could say are decreasing in absolute value to zero. Since this is the case, that means we can use the alternating series error bound, um, which basically says that our error is gonna be less than the absolute value of the next term. Now by error, we mean the distance between this approximation and the true value of the integral. That's what the error really is, is that in between a range there. So we basically need to figure out the error for this integral and then show that that number, whatever it comes out to, is less than 1 10 thousandth. Well, if we need the error to be the, the absolute value of the next term, or less than that at least, um, then that means we just have to plug 1 half into the next term that we would have had, this x to the 10th over 10. So I can say that the error is less than the absolute value of 1 over 2 to the 10th times 10. And this was a no calculator problem, so you actually do need to multiply by 2 a few times. If we do that, 2 to the 10th is 1,024. Multiply by 10, we've got 10,240 in the denominator. And since that denominator is bigger than this other denominator, this number is clearly less than 1 10 thousandth, which we explicitly write, thereby proving what they wanted us to prove. For this no calculator free response, we're given this function 2x over 1 plus x squared. And for the first part, we want the first four non-zero terms in general term of a Taylor series about x equals 0. Well, the key on this one is recognizing that we have the makings of a geometric series. This is in a1 over 1 minus r form. So since this is geometric, we just need to get that first value in that common ratio, and we can use that to generate whatever we want of this series. So our first term, our a1, is just the numerator here, this 2x value. For the r value that we're multiplying by over and over again, that's going to be whatever we're subtracting from 1. Well, we're subtracting negative x squared if we're writing positive x squared. So that is our r value. So now writing out the first four non-zero terms, we've got 2x. We kind of get that one for free. And then multiplying by negative x squared to get the rest of them, we have negative 2x cubed plus 2x to the fifth minus 2x to the seventh. And then for the general term, we're alternating. So we're going to have a, a negative 1 to the n power. We're also going to need a 2 no matter what because that's in every single term. And then we should have, let's see here, an x to the, how about 2n plus 1. That should do it if we're starting with an n value of 0. There we go. For this part of the problem, we want to know if the series from part A, when evaluated at x equals 1, converges to f of 1. So this is one of those problems where if you already know about intervals of convergence, um, you would have found that the interval of convergence for this thing was x uh, greater than negative 1 and less than positive 1. And since we're trying something that is not in the interval of convergence, the function's not going to converge with the series that we just wrote. If you didn't know anything about that because we haven't covered it yet, then another way to do this is just to simply plug in 1 to the function here and then plug in 1 to your series and see what happens. So plugging in 1 to the original function, that's 2 times 1 over 1 plus 1 squared. That's 2 over 2, which comes out to 1. And now let's plug 1 into our series. So that's going to be, this was our original series. So we had 2 times 1 minus 2 times 1 cubed plus 2 times 1 to the fifth, so on and so forth. Um, this is 2 minus 2 plus 2 minus 2. And that repeats on and on um, over and over again to infinity. So does this converge to a value of 1? Well, we're only going to be able to get two possible values at any point in this series. Either 0, because you just subtracted 2 from itself, or 2, because you just added 2 to 0. And that just keeps happening over and over again. Since this series keeps alternating between 0 and 2 when x equals 1, this is not going to converge really at all, let alone to positive 1. For this problem, they're telling us the derivative of ln of 1 plus x squared is 2x over 1 plus x squared. Now, we could have found this on our own, um, but the reason they're highlighting this is because they want us to find the first four non-zero terms of a series for ln of 1 plus x squared about x equals 0. Well, we have the antiderivative of this function here. 
And the reason that's important, because we have a series for this function. We found it in part A. It was this geometric series. So if taking the antiderivative of the original function gives me the function they're asking about, taking the antiderivative of the series that represents that original function is going to give me the series that they're asking for here. Um, so I just need to take the antiderivative of all of this, and that's going to give me the series for ln of 1 plus x squared. So taking my antiderivative, and I'm going to do this from 0 to x because this is centered about x equals 0. And when I do this, I don't have to put any t's inside an evaluation box because um, 0 is going to cancel out all of those uh, lower limit terms. So I end up with just x squared minus, let's see, this bumps up to 4, so this is 2 over 4 or 1 half x to the fourth. Next, bumping this up to a 6, we've got 1 third x to the sixth. And finally, this exponent bumps up to an 8, 2 over 8 is 1 fourth minus 1 fourth x to the eighth. And there we have it. For this problem, they want us to use the series found in part c to find a rational number a, such that a minus ln of 5 fourths, absolute value, less than 1 hundredth. Okay, so this might make not a lot of sense right now, what they're asking for here. Um, but at the very least, let me redisplay what we had in part c up here so that we have it as a reference. Now, if you take a look at part c, we were basically asked to write a series for ln of 1 plus x squared. And inside this absolute value, we also have an ln of 5 fourths. Well, maybe this ln and this ln have some connection. In fact, they do. The ln of 5 fourths is just the ln of 1 plus something that we plugged in for x. It's the exact value of that, whatever that x value is. And we'll find the x value in a second. But whatever that exact x value is, whatever the exact value of that ln function is, we also have some approximation that we got by plugging that x value into this series and then just stopping the adding of terms at some point. So we're essentially trying to find the error between some approximated polynomial and the true value of ln of 5 fourths. Let's start by finding the x value, because that's going to tell us what we need to plug into this series to even come up with an a value. So if we have ln of 5 fourths and ln of 1 plus x squared, that means that 1 plus x squared and 5 fourths must be equivalent. So the x value then is whatever I get by subtracting 1 and square rooting. Well, 5 fourths minus 1 is 1 fourth. Square root of that is going to be 1 half. So that's our magic x value. So the a value then that we're looking for is going to be the result of some truncated polynomial that we get by plugging 1 half into this series and then stopping at some point. So it's going to have the form 1 half squared minus 1 half times 1 half to the fourth plus 1 third 1 half to the sixth and so on and some forth so forth. At some point we have to stop adding these and that'll be our a value. Okay, so how do I know when to stop? Well, the key here is recognizing that this is an alternating series and more than that it's an alternating series whose terms are decreasing in absolute value to zero. Because if you look at this, the denominator just keeps growing, the numerator does not, so these terms are getting closer and closer to zero while they alternate. This means that we can use the alternating series error bound to help us out here. Now this error bound says that our error is going to be less than the absolute value of the next term. So we basically need to make sure that whenever we stop adding these things, the very next term has a value that is uh, in line with this 1 over 1 hundredth. So to officially state what we're doing here, we're going to find a k value where k is the number of terms in our approximated series, a k value such that the k plus 1th term absolute value is less than 1 hundredth. Because um, that will guarantee that the error, which this is really a code for, the error in general is less than 1 hundredth. And then we're just going to add the first k terms together after we find that magic k term. All right. So let's start looking at k plus 1th terms. Um, let's start with this very first term, 1 half squared. That has a value of 1 fourth. That's less than, that's greater than 1 hundredth actually. Um, so that's not the k plus 1th term we're looking for. All right, well, it was the first term anyway, so that would have been kind of awkward. Let's look at the next term. 1 half times 1 half to the fourth. That's really 1 over 32, 1 over 2 to the fifth. 1 over 32 is better, but it's still greater than 1 hundredth. It does not meet that error threshold. 
Um, so this can't be our k plus 1th term either. Well, let's keep going because we're getting closer. Next term, we've got 1 over 3 times 1 over 64, essentially. Uh, that's going to be, if you do some quick mental math or on paper math, 1 over 192. 1 over 192, that is less than 100 because the denominator is bigger with the same numerator. So that means that our third term is our k plus 1th term. Well, that means that our approximated polynomial that gets us this error bound is just going to be the first two terms. So our a value then is just going to be 1 fourth minus this 1 over 32. And you could leave it like that because it's all constants. Or if we simplify this, this is really 8 over 32 minus 1 over 32 for a grand total of 7 over 32.